Hey, hier ist Alex und in dieser Folge reden wir darüber, wie eins der erfolgreichsten No-Code-Startups, das sogar noch aus Berlin kommt, mit 0 Euro Werbeausgaben auf 150.000 User skaliert ist. Unser Gast ist Mariam Hokobin. Sie ist CEO und Gründerin von Softer.io. Softer ist ein Tool, mit der wirklich jeder in kürzester Zeit Web-Apps bauen kann. Also im Grunde genommen genau das, was angehende Gründerinnen und Gründer irgendwann brauchen, eine Präsenz im Netz. Wir reden aber nicht nur über Softer, sondern auch wie Mariam den für sie passenden Investor gefunden hat, warum sie überhaupt Venture Capital annimmt und ob künstliche Intelligenz Fluch oder Segen für ihr Geschäftsmodell ist. Ich glaube nämlich, dass man den Case für beides machen kann. Am Ende teilt Mariam natürlich auch, wie immer, die zwei Geschäftsideen, die sie machen würde. Das ist ja ein bisschen der Witz von diesem Podcast hier. Und natürlich sind das die zwei Geschäftsideen, die sie machen würde, wenn sie nicht so beschäftigt wäre mit Softer. Mir hat es großen Spaß gemacht. Ich hoffe dir auch. Und jetzt rein ins Gespräch. Mariam, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Alex. Great to be here. It's great having you. I've been using your product for quite a while and I've been talking on this podcast that I've been using your product. <laughs> so uh, I, I can I can say that I'm quite a fan. Uh, so I'm really happy to have you on the show and get some behind the scenes action and some some insights into uh, what, what's actually going on with the software. So thank you for being here. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. And we'd love to hear, you know, also the ins and outs of your, you using the product and probably you'll share more. Yeah, happy to do so. So um, maybe let's kick us off. Let's let's uh, get our listeners kind of involved in what you do. And I read on your LinkedIn page, I read an interesting comparison. You say on LinkedIn that software is like the Canva of web apps. What does that mean? Yeah, great question. So it's actually something, it's not us saying it, but our customers have kind of coined that about software. And um, the reason they say that is because basically what Canva did is before Canva, there was Photoshop, right? And lots of people, especially designers, mostly professional designers would use Photoshop to design different assets or any kind of images, etc. And then what Canva did, basically, they democratized that opportunity. And now everyone can be a designer. Everyone is a kind of a designer. They can produce any type of design they want within like minutes, hours, etc. So uh, because software, so um, just as a context, software is a knockout platform that lets anyone build uh, applications on top, internal tooling, client portals, etc., using your own data, Airtable or Google Sheets. And our goal really is to make it extremely simple, easy to use, but powerful at the same time. So um, when people use our product, they find it extremely easy. They uh, it typically it gets included in lots of you know beginner type products that it's very because of the ease of use. And that's also what, that's basically the reason they um, may find it find similarities between Canva and software because it's extremely easy to use and it almost democratizes access to building applications, anything without code. So same level applications and designs that um, any developer could produce. So um, I guess that's, yeah, that's kind of the main reason that um, it comes across. Also another comparison similar to that is iPhone, like iPhone uh, versus the professional camera, where professional camera is the is the existing alternatives, either writing with code, building something with code or other uh, platforms. And then iPhone is um, software. So with iPhone, you still take amazing photos with great professional, you know, um, quality but it, it's so easy right everyone has an iphone in their pocket and everyone can take a photo mm -hmm. understood i like that notion so basically you're saying what used to be very hard building web uh, web apps websites let's put it that way uh, you guys make it incredibly simple by just adding a user interface on some underlying data sources like Airtable or the google sheets in a way mm -hmm. and that is being used as um Uh, websites, for example, you could do uh, job sites, marketplaces, but also internal uh, tools. Um, that's basically what people use you to, uh, you guys for. And maybe let's double click on that for a second, just to make sure that our, our uh, listeners understand the difference uh, uh, between you guys and some other products out there. So maybe let's stress that again. I mean, there's a ton of ways to get websites out. You know, there's mm -hmm. Wix, there's Squarespace, there's Webflow. You mentioned that, you know, 
uh, you guys are not the high end. You know, you guys are not going to be the best use case for something super sophisticated, but it's something, you know, to uh, as an entry level for, for websites. So, but also Wix and Squarespace, they have this kind of value proposition. So how are you guys different? Mm -hmm. Let's kind of underscore that for a second to, mm -hmm. to Wix or Scare, Squarespace. Yeah, actually, actually the vice versa. So what I mean is with software, the goal is to make something, make something is extremely easy and simple, but still the thing you produce as an application is pretty powerful. And it's an application versus website. So the way we look at it, we, we call it, different people call different things a website, but websites typically are the static marketing sites where there is no any you know business logic, there's no database involved. It's just static pages that you can navigate. And then the real applications, whether it's internal tool or any external facing application, that um, comes with a database where you store all of the information, the data architecture that is going to be shown in the website. And then there is a business logic involved, let's say login, sign-in functionality, payments, et cetera, what happens when user clicks this button, et cetera, et cetera. And then there is a front-end application. So software is not really, it's not a website builder. So we, Vix and Squarespace, Webflow, they're not competitors. They're not the similar types of products. So software in, in, instead is an application builder. So with software, you build things like CRMs, client portals, you know, project management systems, um, employee directories or customer success type pl platform. So basically really um, more um, application focused type products, especially especially more business use cases. That's what, yeah, the main kind of focus area. Got it. I mean, on digitaloptimist.de, we use it to, to we we'll basically have a database for all the business ideas that are being shared on the podcast. And uh, it's a perfect product because, you know, we need some kind of database that we store in Airtable, but you could also do it in Google Sheets or whatever you want to use. And then uh, you guys bring this to the internet in a way uh, and you uh, put a UI on top of it so that people can navigate it and access it uh, in the end. Who, so let's, let's kind of, um, <clears throat> yeah, kind of move on a little bit. Uh, who are your customers? Who, uh, to whom does this product appeal to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. And uh, the answer is almost anybody can use software. We have, of course, some focus areas, but as an example, well, because the product is pretty horizontal, right? So the way it works is we, in the product, it gives you the building blocks. So think of it as a Lego. When you have Lego pieces, you can just assemble them together and get all different types of Legos. So similarly in software, every other piece of software like authentication, login functionality, payments, or list showing some kind of visualization of your data. Everything is a building block in software. So basically we give you those building blocks and you can, from that um, list of blocks, you can build any type of app almost like marketing sites, marketplaces, community hubs, but then also more powerful apps as internal tooling and client portals. So, um, that also means our customer base is pretty, pretty um, basically broad. So it starts from, you know, on the lower end, lower end meaning like the simpler use cases are more entrepreneurs, prosumers building their own startup ideas, MVPs for their products. And then on the higher end, there is some of the Fortune 500 companies are using software to build internal applications. So um, in between also, there is all different types of customers as nonprofits, big nonprofit organizations, governments, um, universities, etc. So the, the range is pretty broad. However, our, our focus is really core customer base that um, where these customers get the biggest value and stay, you know, longest and continue their journey with software are the business use cases. Either, mm -hmm. you know, non, non tech SMBs where they are trying to digitize their organizations and build internal tooling or client tooling, just kind of any digital tool or within bigger companies, basically think of, um, you know, any technology company where there is an engineering department, engineering departments is always other, the other parts of the companies are always short of engineers, right? They always want to build tools, but they don't have enough engineers and they also don't have the skills to build it themselves. So their software would be powering all of the people internally, whether product sales, marketing to, to use software, to build the tooling they need for their day-to-day -day work. Mm -hmm. Is it a good thing? 
that your potential client base is very broad because you can expand your market, right? There's a, a big piece of the pie that you can kind of capture. Or is it also a challenge because it's sometimes hard to zone in on those users that you really want to win over? Yeah, it's absolutely a big challenge and one of the biggest challenges of any horizontal product. Well, I would say it's it's great that if there is a if the product can power so many use cases and so many customers because you don't have to even, you know, you just put out the product with the baseline functionality and then people can you discover what the different types of people are actually different types of products they would be building but then on the other hand definitely it's a big challenge either uh, building the product or gtm wise as well because basically you have to understand who are your core customers who are the most valuable customers because you have limited time and resources as a startup and just focus on them at least early on to uh, identify the most valuable customers and use cases for you as a company so definitely um and that's also one of the reasons we you know we are we're still learning and it also as you grow as a company the kind of the different target groups keep expanding so you find a product market we did one and then it grows and then it goes to other types of use cases but um yeah i think so far we have that's one of the reasons we are right now focusing very much on business use cases and business types of customers. Um, but we will see. As, as it grows, obviously, it powers a lot more use cases. Mm -hmm. I also read online that you scaled without with zero dollars or zero euro in marketing. Not sure if that's still the case, but in <laughs> any case, uh, it's, it's quite something quite impressive. Um, how do you do that? Without investing any marketing, maybe you can also tell us how big you are, how many users you have, and how mm -hmm. did you do it without spending money in ads? Yeah, absolutely. That's the beauty of horizontal product and also like free product, right? Because our product also is free. You can just go ahead, try and build something on your own without paying. Um, and we have grown from, well, two, two years ago when we launched the product, kind of the web application version, um, until now, we have grown from zero to 150,000 users, almost without any money, almost because just recently we started also doing some ads and testing out different, um, you know, marketing channels. But until until several months ago, yeah, the, we were driven by, it was all driven by organic growth. And organic meaning there is basically a lot of word of mouth because people use the product, they love it, they share with other friends, um, with other, you know, their colleagues, friends, um, and then also direct search content SEO is a big part of it. So we have been investing in that. So basically when people are looking to solve some kind of problem, um, they find software that way. So um, referrals, um, word of mouth and content SEO is, yeah, is one of the, basically the main drivers of the growth. And of course I didn't mention community, which is like at the core of software, meaning Community is the result of people using the product, really loving and help, you know, being happy to share with their other parts of their audiences, their community, their friends, etc. And we also have basically helped kind of build and um, nurture a community around software uh, where these people are basically uh, acting as advo advocates of software. They they create courses, they create their own content around software. They build, they create video, YouTube tutorials. Um, they run affiliates um, and all that kind of stuff. So it's 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 not us paying them, but they just do it because you know they're interested in the product and they love it. They want to share it with more people. Mm -hmm. How do you foster this kind of word of mouth, this kind of, you know, almost growth hack kind of way of, you know, getting people to be ambassadors for your product? Is there any way that, I mean, you have a tech background, so do you think about your product also in a way of what do we have to put out there to make people ambassadors and then give them uh, an incentive to act as, you know, to act as your advertiser in a way and get new people in. How do you how do you foster this kind of community building? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. I no, we haven't done any basically engineering in 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 regards to engineering that community um, kind of willingness to share or to become ambassadors. So far, like right now, we are doing some efforts on helping that grow and engage people engage in, to engage even more and then grow that community. But until now, we haven't really done anything. So I would say the baseline is 
we have just built a product and very, very much focused on intuitiveness and ease of use because we want everyone, basically almost everyone, be able to use the product without technical, without design skills. And I think with that um, very kind of being very intentional in how do we create the product, what gets into it, you know, there is quite some limitations in the product versus what you can do. And there is kind of fine grain between this, I'm here, I can build something that's completely custom. It's my own app. I can design it the way I want. I can brand it the way I want. But then also I, I just created it within an hour. So uh -huh. I think that it just kind of empowers people. They feel like um, when my people create their own things, it's like they're, you know, they're successfully, right? They're all for sharing it and uh, discuss, uh, talking about it, that this is their creation. They're very eager to share it with, with the world. And I think what the difference with many also other platforms is that 90% of our customers almost, they can't use many other platforms because it's just too difficult for them, either too technical or too, too wide range of options. They can't then end up building anything. And I think the difference is really just they successfully are able to build their app, what they want within a very short period of time. So that really is acting as, as a good incentive for them to you know to share it with the world but then also the other part just <clears throat> alongside that we we continued and helped share their creations so just being close to them and you know just if, just rewarding not, not rewarding but rather even just acknowledging and sharing their creations with everyone else we know right our own community that just um means a lot for, for them and they they do appreciate mm -hmm. that got it putting them on a pedestal and offering them an audience uh and obviously, you know, having a product that 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 works. There's another company that got quite big uh, without zero dollars of uh, marketing. Um, not sure you can guess it, but it's a car manufacturer yeah. out of California. <laughs> Their name is Tesla. So uh, you're not the only. <laughs> There's many ones, others actually. <laughs> yeah, I think Figma right, as well. Okay. Um, you know, Figma mm -hmm. and Canva early on as well, and I think even Survey Monkey, similar type, well, form product. I think they have gone to several millions in revenue also without without uh, much marketing. But mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think it, I don't know about Tesla, what you have in mind, but I think in like whenever we look at those types of products to us, it comes back to the product and why people, you know, like it so much or they use it so much and they share it with their friends. It's just kind of, mm -hmm. yeah, that happens. There's a lot of organic piece to that. Yeah. I mean, obviously uh, Elon Musk, he gets a lot of, Uh, you know, unpaid ads with this just as bigger than life personality. Uh, you don't care. I don't, I, I think he could launch anything, uh, you know, and it would be quite a success because he's just such a, such a bigger than life personality. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is because you are quite successful when it comes to fundraising, you closed, uh, I think you called it, I'm not sure if you call it series A or seed, uh, but okay. sizable okay. series okay, A, there one. you go over uh, $13 million, dollars, I believe, uh, in the last round, you got some great investors in, um, I wondered, I had a very naive question. If you are able to do this without venture capital money, uh, without, sorry, without advertisement budgets, um, why do you need venture capital money? Have you ever thought about doing this without VC money? Because let me, maybe, maybe because this might be a counterintuitive question. Obviously, when you take venture capital money, you have to play their game, right? And now it's about, you know, extending valuations, becoming bigger. Uh, you know, is there maybe another path that you thought about not taking venture capital money, but making this into a profitable business that you can grow maybe, maybe bootstrap out of yourself? Is that mm -hmm. a thought you mm -hmm. had? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, we, we can become profitable if you want to pretty soon. So <laughs> it still is not, um, it's not <laughs> yes, no question. I think it, <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. yes, actually early on, we started by bootstrapping software. I don't know if many people know that, but Uh, it was just two founders, uh, you know, working alongside our jobs. And we we had a goal in mind that we wanted to build something and then really launch and see customers using it. We didn't kind of went ahead and raise funding. We actually, when we raised our seed round, we already had quite some revenues and quite some customers because we wanted to validate it first for us um, and whether this product is something that people will use and people will pay for. Um, and the reason we raised was early on, we knew we wanted to raise capital long 
term down the line, just because in order to build such a complex product, like the product itself is basically a software that lets others build their own software on top. So it's extremely complex technologically and it does require a lot of effort, engineering effort. Um, and of course, you know, product and UX skills, design skills, us being so much, you know, focused on the UI and simplicity, etc. And in order to really in the market, you know, in this market to create a big company and to be in front of innovation and, you know, not be outcompeted by many other companies that especially nowadays, right, no code is is um, becoming more and more popular. People already understand the value and there's so many companies being created. I think just in this race to be successful long-term and to build something big, you just have to have that capacity and uh, resources. We could still have gone and created, you know, the first version. We would be much farther behind mm -hmm. um, in our build development of the product for sure, because um, we wouldn't be able to hire all those engineers and the product and the, the, our, our team, right, who who helped us to be so to bring software where we are today. So I think that's kind of the main one of the main reasons that yes, we knew we wanted to raise, we had to raise if we want to be long-term successful, else we would just be going very slowly and potentially left behind as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Obviously, you're not alone in the world, right? There's other competitors out there um, who, who want to go fast as well, understood. Maybe let's let's uh, pivot. Maybe this is a good time to pivot to one other area that, I was in, that I'm interested in, and that is the whole no-code slash AI space. Ein ganz kurzer Werbebreak. Dieser Podcast hat nur ein Ziel. Wir wollen dir die Inspiration für deinen nächsten Side-Hustle oder dein nächstes Startup geben. Auf digitaloptimisten.de haben wir jetzt die perfekte Datenbank für dich aufgebaut, in der wir alle Geschäftsideen, die wir hier im Podcast besprechen, ganz detailliert aufbereiten und runterschreiben. Und das Beste ist, wir haben auch ein einminütiges Quiz, das dir die perfekt auf dich zugeschnittene Geschäftsidee liefert. Schau vorbei auf digitaleoptimisten.de slash quiz, mach das einminütige Quiz und finde die Startup-Idee oder Side-Hustle-Idee, die perfekt zu dir passt. Das war die Werbung, zurück zum Gespräch. In your eyes, is AI a huge opportunity for you guys over at Software or is it a big threat? Yeah, uh, good question. It can be both, right, in general for any company, I think, today in, in today's market. Um, depends on how the company leverages AI, I believe. Um, because, well, obviously there is so much development in the recent like months even, and um, everything is moving extremely quickly. I think the companies who are leveraging AI in different ways successfully, they will be ahead of the curve from many other competitors. And it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, AI completely can generate all of the app end-to-end -end what you need. But um, one thing we are, you know, experimenting with in software is also leveraging AI to help you build faster, to help you build many more things than you have to do from scratch yourself, right? So there is lots of ways you can leverage that. One early version, what we did was we, last December, we launched um, integration with OpenAI. Actually, I think software was the first product first no-code platform to integrate with OpenAI. Um, and we mm -hmm. now in the platform we offer, so any customer can come in and either not only just generate images and text for their application, but also create entire apps like SaaS products like Jasper AI or Copy AI, where their end customers can can use their tool to generate images, copy, etc. So we have seen those um, use cases as well. And that's kind of the first step. Um, but now also experimenting more how we can leverage it in turn, like, you know, for, for all other types of more business related use cases. And I think long term, yeah, you never know what's going to happen. But um, obviously, there will be more development around AI helping to build the apps you want. I don't think Again, I don't think any time like in the next months or years, we're going to be at a point where there is no need at all uh, for human or a platform involvement to, to really make it kind of final version or successful application to launch. But we will see. <laughs> maybe I'm wrong. Mm. Yeah, it's an interesting topic uh, because maybe uh, if I 
if I play devil's advocate for one minute, uh, uh, and I, I just want to see if, if this is something that you think about, because you build your product on Airtable and Google Sheets, I mean, this gives you a ton of flexibility, right? And, and ability for everyone to use the product. Um, but let's see, you know, let's say Google Sheets or Airtable. Imagine, you know, they say, well, click of a button and you can build just a, a, a templated a website, you know, to get this uh, page online. Um, I mean, there are products out there where you can just type in in a, in a text query and you put yep. in, I want a website for my nail salon or forever, mm -hmm. whatever. These are websites. You made the, the, the mm -hmm. distinction mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. beginning. These are website, not web apps as you right. build. There's no database behind it. But uh, is this something that you think about? Maybe even something that uh, is uh, when you think about at night, you know, when all the noise of the day goes away, is that something maybe you even worry a little bit about as of, you know, going Airtable, going a little bit more vertical and doing this, the things that you do? Mm, not really, I'd say. I mean, um, yeah, there's always any, any company can basically, um, Google, um, Amazon, they, they have their own no code builders, right? But again, like it hasn't gotten big adoption. Yeah, there is always going to be, I think the market is just so huge of software building in general that there's always going to be multiple players and different types of use cases, different types of personas, et cetera, that always will be there. But I think um, in our case, again, well, first of all, software's goal is to be completely data agnostic, not just Airtable and Google Sheet, but basically we act as the application front-end builder for any of your data source. So within one app, you can connect to Google Sheet, Airtable, maybe another page uses data from Salesforce and something else uses your production database. So that basically um, is, is, not, is not just one type of Google Sheet, even if there was a builder that doesn't contradict having also you using software, this, that those are just different use cases. Um, and we have gotten this question of, especially Airtable, you know, Airtable interfaces, like all the time from investors of what if they build something that, you know, um, basically is the same as software. I think again, um, potentially, yes, there's always a risk, but the question is, who are the customers, what types of use cases they want to cover. And what we have seen so far is, you know, every product solves a specific need. Airtable specifically is most um, focused on and building like a database of your organization. So really acting as the data hub and having all of the automations, et cetera, inside Airtable and uh, providing external or internal tools on top of this data hasn't been the focus area and hasn't been, they have built interfaces, but still it's it's completely different from software. Software is a full application builder uh, connecting to different data sources and the people using building with software have different use cases than they can cannot build with Airtable interface. So I think there is lots of nuances always, whatever other product we discuss. Um, Either um, for some niche use cases, maybe it works, but I think from our end, we are looking at it more like globally and just for software being this one place to build a full stack application and especially connecting to all of your different types of data sources, which is something that um, the others are not, are not necessarily offering. Mm -hmm. Understood. And maybe Airtable has a lot. Of, they, I think they have a lot on their plate, uh, right? Just to win their space. And uh, maybe it'll take some yes. time. Uh, yeah, uh, there's lots of about also other, other areas. For sure. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they have also um, have been developing interfaces for quite some time. And then, yeah, there's also the speed question, of course, right? As a startup, you are much faster, much more focused than like it's what takes uh, one um, year in bigger companies, it takes a month in a startup. So again, there is there is lots of these different aspects that, when you look at that all together, um, yeah, mm -hmm. the chances are extremely. That in your example, yeah, you, you, it's interesting that in your example you view yourself as the startup and Airtable as the established company. Because I think people from Google will probably look uh -huh. at Airtable as the startup and themselves right. as the. But it's interesting, to see, you know, the cycles, the the recursive iterations are just getting quicker <laughs> and quicker. Maybe uh, let's uh, t spend some time talking about the no-code movement, as some people call it, right? Some people say the dawn of no-code. You yourself are an engineer, um, so uh, you can also say that there's, um, and you mentioned it before, 
there's a, quite a demand for engineers at the moment, uh, but there's also a shortage of engineers, at least, you know, when I also look into the companies that I work for. So um, no code has kind of been this messiah for companies, you know, to just get rid of all the code and just uh, democrat. you said it yourself, democratize a technology in a way. Um, I heard this call for no code for quite some time. Uh, I'm wondering, where do we stand in terms of this big no-code revolution coming around? Has AI given it a massive boost? And now everyone's talking about no-code. But maybe in a nutshell, what's the state of no-code? Is it going to mm -hmm. break through into the big corporates now? Or do we still have some important advancements that we need to take before this takes hold of the whole market? Mm -hmm. I think it has already. <laughs> That's you know my my uh, me being in the no code space. Maybe I'm in a bubble, but just I think <laughs> even um, even tools like Airtable, Zapier, Make they all are no code tools, right? In a way, abstracting and automating processes, databases, and data you know move movements from one place to the other. And I think in the last like now is the time where there is just so many use cases of bigger companies, corporates, enterprises, but also smaller companies, you know, startups, et cetera, leveraging no-code tools um, in their organization. That is not, it's not even a question anymore. I think it, it, it is already happening. It depends on, I think, with what, what maybe what companies and what countries you're looking at, I would say, like also a biggest portion of our customer base is from the US. So maybe there is like technology advancement is much going much faster in the US, like US based companies. And then in Europe, like for example, France is much more ahead ahead in no code. They like there's tons of customers and users using no code in France. There's big communities. I would say Germany is a bit behind with that, but we also have great, you know, examples in Germany. And just just us like looking at our customer base right now. When I'm seeing you know a government leveraging no code tools to build things for their you know organization or nonprofit big universities, it's like that's that's a proof to me that you know maybe yes some departments are still behind. Maybe again depends on what types of people you have. It's still at the early days for sure, but it's already happening. Um, yeah. All right. It's interesting to see that Germany is always <laughs> lagging behind when it comes to e-commerce. People <laughs> say uh, Germany is always behind. It's, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, we have to speed it up a little bit. But this leads me to another question, uh, maybe talking about you, Mariam, for, for a second. You are originally from Armenia, so you're Armenian. And Softer is based in Berlin, Germany, even though, I, if I understand correctly, you have talent from all over the world but uh, the headquarters is in Berlin. So how, why did you decide to found software in Germany? Mm -hmm. Well, I was living in Germany for quite some time, for about 10 years now. And um, also one of the reasons for me to move to Berlin was early on, it was 10 years ago when Berlin tech scene isn't, wasn't there yet. It was just kind of evolving and being kind of created. At the time, I was actually joined a company startup where um, it was it was difficult to hire people from um, outside other countries, and there, there you had to provide a reason to bring someone from external instead of hiring someone from Germany. Uh, but nowadays, right, every other company is like asking for wherever people come from. We need talent. We need you know engineers. We need more product people, etc. And it doesn't really like I think I think that has changed a lot. And I was already here working in different companies um, before starting Software. And then yeah, I was kind of I was part of uh, entrepreneur first incubator accelerator, whatever you call it. And then basically from there on went into you know building building Software. Uh, but then around that time was. I mean, I was based in Berlin, so there was no other, uh, it wouldn't make sense for me to start a company, at least headquarter a company mm -hmm. somewhere else. Um, so that's how we kind of went about it. But the company itself as a company, as software, we are fully remote. We actually only have four employees in Germany, uh, the two founders and two other employees. Everyone else is is everywhere else in the, con in the, com yeah, in the world. <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, looking at your CV, you also dabbed with uh, or looked into venture capital for some time, <laughs> if I read that correctly. 
Um, you were a fellow at a, a, what I understand, a, a kind of a program, you know, where you learn from venture capital, you try to understand. And I guess you try to understand if venture capital was the path for you to go because you, you have a history of being a founder even before software. What did you learn as a fellow at this uh, included VC, uh, mm -hmm. VC program? Yeah. It's like an amazing. Maybe, why didn't you decide to go that path? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's a. It was an amazing program, and uh, the program basically is there to help um, people from, especially underrepresented um, groups like um, female or um, minorities or black, um, bringing basically finding talent and bringing them together to help them learn and get into VC space. So the reason actually at the time when I joined, I already started working on software like very, very early on. And one of the, there was two reasons for me to join that. One reason was that I wanted to um, just explore is this generally, I uh, wrote something that I'm interested in, etc. And then the second part was If, um, yeah, I, I wanted to learn more about venture capital, understand, you know, what it takes to raise venture capital. Does it make sense in general for me? Do I want to raise venture capital, etc.? So it was a huge learning path and it was definitely a huge contributor also, you know, for, for my success in the future to raise funds. And basically the way I was looking at it is, was in previously in my job as an engineer. So I, I worked as an engineer. I did tons of interviews. And then when I transitioned into more leadership roles, I was interviewing engineers. So my learning from that was when you are on the other side of the table as a leader interviewing engineers or the vice versa, you basically are much better positioned in understanding what the other side thinks, right? And what how they think about things, how they expect, how they ask questions, how they expect the answers to be, and just just better at at anything, negotiating or or uh, being successful at the interview. So to me, that was kind of the same because being a founder or being on the other side as an investor, basically, if I were on the other side, I'll learn so much more about venture capital. Just that would help me as a on a professional level, um, but also on being just being founder for future fundraising, but then also potentially if I were to be an investor. So to me, it was just win-win. Uh, um, it was also a chance that didn't necessarily impact anything with my work on software. And I was like, yeah, uh, why not give it a try? And uh, I kind of dived into it. Um, one thing that I learned from there while going through the program, that was a year program, I, what I realized is at least right now, I don't want to become a venture capital also because I'm, I'm a more builder type. I, I like building stuff. I like to be on the other side of the table. I like to be in the execution of building a company versus, you know, investing or funding a company or being on the just advising side. And then, yeah, that's how I, I, I was like just sure and 100% <laughs> dived into, okay, I want to be the founder side, <laughs> on the yeah. founder side. And yeah. What did you do differently after the program when talking to venture capital investors uh, than you did previously? So you must have learned something, how to talk to investors, what to show them, what not to show them, what to emphasize. What was your biggest learning? Maybe that's our listeners can also take away. Yeah, uh, actually, I'm trying to remember if before the program I did speak to investors. I think so. Yeah. No, actually, no. Before, before the program, I... I wasn't raising, I didn't raise. So I wasn't really in that kind of realm of founder fundraising. But there is there is some lessons definitely I learned and I, I, I used from you know from the product program, which is you know what how how because how investors are evaluating companies, what are they looking for, right? Like the typical stuff in general, if you are really just going out reading and looking at different materials, etc. But it was, was more kind of targeted, very high quality. And uh, I knew this is not just, you know, in the internet, everyone talks different things, but this is like very real. This is very quality. And this is something I can rely on. Um, yeah, just like the basics of, you know, venture capital, how it works, how even as a founder, what does it mean for you as a company, for you as a founder, and how investors are evaluating founders and the vice versa as a founder, how you should evaluate investors, what you should look for in investors. So yeah, all of that, basically, it's not one or two things. It's everything involved that definitely mm -hmm. set the right path for the future. 
Got it. But I'm trying to get one thing out of you. <laughs> so maybe one thing that you just, uh, maybe let's, let's flip it. Choosing an investor. Mm -hmm. What is your, what are the, what is the, maybe the most important criterion for you to say, I'm going to go with this investor and not with that investor? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is definitely that. Uh, and that one thing is we talk to hundreds of investors and the, the way I would judge which investor I want to work with is do they understand the product and do they care about the product long term? Do they care about this problem and the, and the product? Are they are they product driven versus are they revenue driven? Um, maybe the, the, the two way to separate mm -hmm. because I think there is a lot of the times where investors there's investors that are very much on you know numbers driven and revenue driven, which is great. You know, revenue is always the output, but that's not what that always a lot of the times might set the startup um, to a failure path if if you're optimizing for revenue, revenue versus just building out the product in the right way with the right you know um, cadence and the pace. Because especially for us, for like building this product, we're still building it. We are still at the core of building, building the core of the product. It takes years. While we have been growing also, you know, in revenues, which is great. It, but at the same time. Uh, we wanted to have investors who are with us and who are especially, you know, have been on the operator side, who have been founders potentially themselves, who have been executing and operating in the company, and they they have been in our shoes, in short, I guess. Got it. So looking for investors that get it, you know, what you're about, what you want to do with your company, and not forcing you on different path uh, yes. if you um, if you don't want exactly. to do that. Mariam, I have so many questions I would love to ask you. Um, uh, you know, I would love to also dab a little bit more into uh, that you're a, te uh, a CEO with a tech background. I think that's kind of very interesting to see how you, how you kind of do that. You also, and congratulations on that, just launched number one on Product Hunt, which is a, a site where, you know, new product launches are announced. Uh, so that's a huge thing worldwide. I think number one on the day, number two on the week. The granny Sorry? of uh, the granny of tech tech products, as as the community says, I think. <laughs> okay. Is it really? Is the, that the, the way Oscar, the Oscar of tech products. The I Oscar. Think there we yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> the, I think that's it. Yeah. So the really well done. Got a ton of traction. Um, yeah, but I would uh, I would be a fool if I wouldn't shift gears now a little bit, and I think uh, our listeners would be very disappointed because uh, what many what we do is also we talk about business ideas. And my hypothesis is that people like you, who have been not one time founder, but a multiple uh, a serial entrepreneur in a way, and you also have that VC side, they tend to look at the world looking at opportunities and often see new opportunities that they could then build a business on. So that's why I think this is so fruitful to talk to operators like you or investors about business ideas. And I know, Mariam, that you brought one or two ideas with you. You want to <laughs> share the first one, your first business idea that you would like to do if you weren't so busy doubling down on software at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not um, I, like very big ideas that you know I have in mind, but I'll share what I was thinking about. Actually, the good thing is that I think if I were to do again, to build something again, I would definitely build software again. Like just the idea, it's it's something that I do believe, you know, uh, very deeply, and it's something I want to exist in the world and uh, just just happy building it. So I think that's a good problem. That's great. Um, huh? That's a great sign. <laughs> that's, a, exactly. that's a good question to ask yourself. Huh? Would I would I found this again? To think yeah, if you yeah. still have the passion for it, exactly. so that's a good sign. So I think uh, I always. So what I uh, what happens a lot uh, many times when I see our customers building with software. So what we have seen also, you know, we have also customers like three, four at least that I know of that have built something with customer and exited. They have sold them as well. So they sold them as companies and products. So what I always get uh, jealous in a good way is that uh, I always think of myself if I were to have more time or we're not working on software, I would definitely be in the shoes in the other side, like in the shoes of our customers. I would be using no-code tools and products, even though being technical, right? I, I, I think I wouldn't code. I would definitely use these products to build different types of things. Um, and especially more bootstrap type product, products and companies, mm -hmm. because I think with the emergence of no-code and just it, it being really 
becoming more and more powerful. There's just so many opportunities that people don't even need venture funding. They don't need every company to become a unicorn, right? There's tons of problems in the market to be solved in especially niche areas that it's so easy to pick no-code platform, validate ideas, and just dive in and even continue building your ideas with no-code. So I think some of the ideas, like those are just mini ideas. So in my no, portfolio- go, This is of, perfect. We love know, mini ideas here. Yeah. Ideas, <laughs> so go like ahead. they- you know, like someone could just take and be creating templates for different no-code platforms. Like we have that problem. We don't manage to create too many templates. And we are we now are creating uh, like a place for people to turn their apps into templates. So it's so easy to kind of go ahead and even earn money on the internet by creating templates of existing no-code platforms. You just have the you just have to learn the tool and that's it. Then um, that's really I mean, interesting, of Mariam. Templates can I, can I pause of use on that? cases. Yes, sure. Mm-hmm. Can I pause? Because I think that's a that's a really interesting idea. Um, so basically, I think there have been marketplaces on um, even uh, Google Chrome. You know, there's even a marketplace yeah. for Google Chrome extensions that some people don't know. There's um, templates uh, for Salesforce, for example, yeah, you know, that exactly. are, have, have some mm-hmm. kind of monetization. And so you're saying... Uh, there's also going to be marketplaces for all these templates for no code, just like software. So do you already offer a marketplace where I could monetize my own template and then sell it to others? And, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. you guys are baby like, like the Amazon mm-hmm, for, mm-hmm. Uh, for this, for these software applications. Do you already yeah. have that? Coming, coming soon. So in summer, we actually oh, plan wow. to launch mm-hmm. the first version without monetizing it yet. So our creators could mm-hmm. just turn their template, their apps into templates. So think of it this way. Someone has built a community app or a logistics application. Uh, they can simply set it as a template and others can reuse that. Instead of us as a company creating templates, it's creators creating their own use case. It's very niche, right? We don't even know what use case they have, but because they are so close to the problem, they know the problem, they have solved it. Now they are just giving that away or in the future also monetizing. We actually already have seen people creating apps and then selling those in Gumroad or other third party platforms mm-hmm. where you can just add the link and monetize. So we have already seen that happening. Yeah, that's kind of one use case. Another uh, is, again, solving a very specific and niche problem. Let's say there's tons of communities of some kind, specific communities that you can create and bring people together and then start, you know, creating courses, creating digital assets, etc., and then monetize them then uh, that's also something we see use cases happening on software. There is niche markets where there is concrete problems, right? Let's say um, like most most big companies already are, you know, solving the bigger problems. They they don't spend too much. S- small, small problems and small um, audiences or um, the types of customers, they, it doesn't interest mostly the big companies. So there is like tons of opportunities mm-hmm. to solve a real problem and to also, you know, not necessarily be a unicorn, build a unicorn, but small profitable businesses. So that that for sure is also, you know, another option you could you could do, or even like simply just building an agency. So today I, I see almost every other day I see like tons of new agencies coming out who are building with no code for other customers. So you could simply just learn these no code tools. Um, not just software, maybe many others as well, and leverage them and build for clients because there is tons of customers out in the in the world that don't necessarily either have the skills or don't want to spend the time and effort. They rather would pay someone to build it quickly for them. And um, these agencies are just like growing. There is like tons that has been created in the last have been created in the last year that I know of. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, that's another thing you could do, right? Uh, I could simply... Yeah, can I, can I, <laughs> can I double click on the... the uh, can I double click? Uh, sure. Maybe two thoughts. I'll start with the first one. Uh, I love your idea of a no-code agency. We've talked about this in the mm-hmm. podcast uh, too as an opportunity for people, you know, to start their own business. I would... I th- I, and I, I like your thought of niching it down. So I think there is a lot of potential if you are even if you are super specific. For example, yeah. we had one listener. Uh, I mean, when we talked about that idea on the podcast, we got so many listeners uh, writing to us on mm-hmm. LinkedIn or uh, via email, uh, inquiring about you know this business idea. This says I think this is the number one idea that sparked the most interest out of our uh, digital optimism community. And what I when we talk about it, we usually say, uh, for example, there's one person who wrote us about the. Um, 
what's the uh, English word, the metal industry, um, I'm mm -hmm. lacking the English mm -hmm. word, so mm -hmm. the metal mm -hmm. producing yeah. companies. Yeah. And he said, well, I'm working there now and they have extreme problems with yeah. worker shortage, uh, but he knows about this, the, you know, okay. the specific issues that these metal yeah. producing companies have. So and when we said, well, you know, this is perfect. Just take the biggest issue. And this might be, you know, automating uh, supplier um, uh, relationships or customer mm -hmm. support, or it could be, you know, writing invoices, something that mm -hmm. might be a bit specific to the, uh, you know, this metal industry, I'm just going to call it. And then, you know, move on and, and try to kind of, uh, you know, take the share of the market and just roll through. I think this would also already exactly. be uh, perfectly uh, for just a bootstrap business. That's not going to be a unicorn, but you're going to probably going to make a living out of it. Yeah, absolutely. And the second idea, like, uh, mm -hmm. the second thought that I had, sorry, go ahead, Mariam, your, no, turn, go your ahead. turn to speak. I was just going to mention that we do have customers, you know, from all over types of industries, like legal, healthcare, and so many specific and like vertical um, industries where, there is most of the tooling there uh, is non-digital, right? There's paperwork, there's Excel sheets and everything, email back and forth. There is so much opportunity there to digitize and just help build the tools they need and to make them more efficient. Um, that most of the companies right now are very much focused on technology companies, right? But there is like huge potential, especially for companies that can be bootstrapped and can be built solving that specific problem. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool that you also think this is an interesting idea. This kind of this is kind of a, a, a proof that you know that we we might be onto something. But let me uh, kind of flesh out the second thought that I had in my head, because you described now is the perfect time to build niche solutions for niche audiences because the advent of no code tools, but also artificial intelligence, making content yeah. production much easier. So we're at this inflection point, I think, of exactly this. You know, targeting mm -hmm. one niche audience with a niche solution and maybe building an agency or whatever, uh, some content that you want to do. So uh, let, let's kind of double click on this a little bit. Uh, I think the more interesting question now is, are there any niche audiences that you feel are underserved? Maybe when you look at, you know, people that are using software to cater to mm -hmm. some niche audiences, yeah. but what are some audiences that you think would be interesting to target with a niche solution? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Many, I think, what you mentioned, all of the non-digital, non-technology companies are in the list, like mm -hmm. legal, healthcare, uh, like construction, logistics industries, and metal, like production, whatever the name of the industry is. Those, and then also like big, big portion and big need that we have seen is, is non-profits, like nor you know usual mm -hmm. non-profits whether it's can be also governments can be universities um, where lots of things are not digital but also especially just non-profits you know who have funds and who want to help um others with some yeah with different types of you know uh, volunteering and um whatever whatever they they offer i think we do have a lot of them who don't basically they can't never they can never uh afford uh never afford an engineer. They will never have an engineering or product department, right? But they mm -hmm. do need the tooling to uh, to to basically get their job done. And mm -hmm. what they would be building, for example, with software is, you know, uh, platforms to manage their donors and to accept payments, platforms to manage their clients or to... Um, to collect all of the, you know, to have volunteer platform where volunteers can log in and know the tasks they need to do. So really interesting use cases, which are quite common, like use case wise and type of application wise with other industries. So definitely like, for example, client portal is a really good example we have seen in all these different industries. And it's, mm -hmm. I think the type of thing that you can build, and especially if you are an agency or freelancer, it doesn't take much for you to build something for different industries. It really is rather for each industry, there is different naming, there is different database, there is different maybe types of pages you have, but all in all, it's solving the same types of problems where mm -hmm. you have some kind of data, somewhere information, you need to give other types of people, whether internally or externally, access to this data and then manage the process not manually, not via email, but through an online self-serve platform. So I think that need mm -hmm. is kind of very common across every industry. I think that's a really cool idea. So basically, you know, what you're saying is 
client portal for industry X. So let's take yes. nonprofits. Yeah. They usually, you know, they might have some kind. Imagine you're a donor to a, 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 a nonprofit organization and they say, wonderful, if you donate over $500, you're going to get access to whatever information you could basically build uh, with software. You could basically build any kind of portal that does just that, that locks access to some content behind, you know, um, uh, a registration in, in the end. And uh, you could do, but you could also do that for, let's say, construction. If someone builds a house or, a, a, you know, a huge industrial plant, you might also want to, um, you know, send different people, you know, the people, I don't know, I don't know the English word, but some people that, you know, lay the foundation, other that, you mm -hmm. know, put the roof on top. Um, mm -hmm. We need to get uh, Samuel inside. He, he's, uh, he's my co-host <laughs> on Unicorn Ideas. He's very big in the construction scene. But you could basically go through the whole construction scene and saying, you know, we're going to build a client portal that makes it much easier for you to uh, manage your projects uh, in yep. a way and, mm -hmm. and, and safeguard some information to some privileged user groups. Or the people on the, on the field, right? If you want them to, let's say, mm -hmm. like delivery services, if someone is delivering something, uh, instead of them going back reporting, they could just have an app on their mobile and click click uh, on, um, on the mobile, upload the invoice, up, update the status that the delivery is done, etc. So everything just right on uh, right real time and, and then eliminating the need for other, other types of processes. So... Mm. Is that what, what, what you actually said is interesting because even now if you look in the market there is like vertical solutions uh, which are offering client portal solutions to every other every other industry there is client portal solutions for mm. legal industry there is client portal solutions for healthcare and many others mm. So basically yeah, exactly. software gives yeah. you kind so of the building blocks of building a client portal and it doesn't matter which industry it is. You just build it mm -hmm. once, you can potentially reuse and repurpose it for many other industries. So it basically, yeah, just gives you the power to construct it the way you want and then to reuse it in other places as well. Interesting. So we got two interesting business ideas. One would, uh, so let me just summarize. One is basically... Uh, you know, making use of the marketplaces that some no-code platforms, you are going to offer that in summer, use templates and monetizing templates. Uh, and the second would be something that you can go to market with is like a client portal that you roll out to different industries and focus your go-to-market on, let's say, construction, legal or nonprofits or whatever. Yeah. That's really interesting. Or you can build an agency, <laughs> but we all already you covered that on the podcast, but it's good to hear it. Yeah. It's good that you, uh, uh, you also had that idea. Wonderful, uh, Mariam. So I think my biggest um, goal today was to not make this like an advertisement, you know, <laughs> because, you know, I use the product. I, I quite like it. Um, so I, I hope that our listeners don't uh, view this as an advertisement. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think we it's really are, interesting what you do. We are not affiliated in any way. <laughs> <laughs> that's true yeah. um so yeah that's uh that's kind of um what i wanted to ask you is there anything else that is important to you that we didn't talk about um i don't think so i think just just go ahead try the product it's free and you can always sign up um and just try building something hopefully within half an hour you already have an app up and running and that hopefully gives you more much more ideas what else you can use it for all right, Maria. Great. That's the plug <laughs> that you all are also got, uh, got in here. Wonderful, Mario. It's great talking to you. Um, uh, thank you for, having, uh, for spending the time and all the best. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for inviting. It's a pleasure.